This is the end Beautiful friend This is the season finale Episode 29 The end Hopefully you've managed to listen to all the other episodes to get here If you have realised the hard work that this werewolf has gone to for you And by him by going to the link in the descriptor below And buying him a coffee Support the show There's also a book you can buy if you want That'd be really cool as well So This is the end As time went on, my level of independence while working became greater and greater. They seemed to be trusting me more and more, testing me less and less. Due to this change, I enjoyed the fact they now had me down as part of the team. (laughs) There's no I in team, and and I am an I. I was not just this thing that they would have to employ or deploy. I was part of the organisation. Over time, there were fewer dicks in my life. I don't mean like cocks. I mean less of the the faceless agents that chaperoned me everywhere and babysat me all the time. I often wondered what two men could actually do in most situations if I kicked off. In conclusion, I'd found not a lot, to be honest. I also began to notice I was under scrutiny less of the time. There was definitely less time being followed and less time being directed or prodded in specific directions. I must admit that my, let's say, behaviour outside work had somewhat improved from a societal standpoint. But this was mainly due to the nature of the work. When on task, it was never dull and almost always gruesome physically and or mentally. My proclivities on Civvy Street really were reined in. I could not beat what I was asked to do for King and Country in the killing, torture and murder departments. I was actually enjoying the job. I hated the orders though and the handlers. The be here and do these things. But I loved the chaos, the killing and the maiming and the chaos and the chaos. This was a particularly strange operation that I'd been asked to do. I'd been given no information about the situation into which I was going. The gear requirement list was short, and none really was specified. I was usually given some necessary information about the things I needed or where I was going, but the list was short and undefined this time. They did not even give me the length of time I would be away. It was all really strange. I was just given tickets and an itinerary. I was not even given a car to the airport. I had to get there myself. It was also strange that I had not met the chief and that they'd let me fly by myself without accompaniment on a standard passenger plane. It was as though they trusted me not to be myself. The flight was very civilised for me. I, I usually was forced into the back of a cargo plane or, if they were in a rush, a private jet, which I always appreciated. Sometimes I flew on passenger jets with others, but then only accompanied by handlers, hoping that they would stop me from doing anything rash. I took this as one of their usual tests. The plane was probably stuffed full of their people, as the chief called them. I was tempted for a brief moment to see if I could cause a plane crash, test my powers of survival, but although it would be fun in its own way, it would probably lead to just fucking inquiries and a lot of bullshit. I would be back in my cage somewhere getting bored if I did the whole plane crash thing. But should I do it? Should I not? Should I do it? Should I not? So tempting. The powers that be did not really enjoy me mixing with ordinary people. This always seemed weird to me as they would just let me run back into the general population without any care after a job. For some reason, things tended to get complicated and out of hand on missions, and then they would have to provide cover for the deaths and the damage that I committed. Never my fault. Obviously, I never looked for trouble. It just found me. The flight was very relaxing. I sat in first class, drank champagne, ate strawberries, and flirted with the in-flight attendants. They treated me very well and the on-board entertainment became very personal with one young man during a bathroom trip. Well worth the extra money for first class. Back in my seat, post-coitally, I relaxed and snoozed. 
They had thought of everything, even buying a spare ticket so Posit could sit next to me in a free chair. Well, that's what I, what I like to think anyway. Not that they did not trust me interacting with many other people. The guy on my left would be my only interaction. And that's when they screwed up. It is how it all started. It's not my fault. So let's get back to it once more. The fucking whiskey was warm. The fucking whiskey was warm. The bitch brought my Macallan warm. That was it. I'd had enough. I reached up and grabbed her by the throat as she tried to pull away, apologising. This was a step too far. I dragged her face towards mine. At a couple of inches from mine, I told her, My Macallan is warm. She wriggled and screamed and tried to strike me with her free hand. My posit lying in his seat sat up, showing interest in, in what was happening. Finally. He transmitted, finally some fucking fun. He tore into my body and I transformed. My body inflated and coagulated into the wolfman, far too large for the constraints of the seats. I ripped and tore into them and, and those around me. My head hit the roof of the cabin and crumpled the panelling as I raged, tearing myself an ample enough space in which to stand. Bedlam reigned around me as I turned into the real me. All through this process, the hostess dangled from my claw. The horror in her face was evident and she drooped like a rag doll in my hand. Once changed, I turned my beast-style head in her direction and snorted my anger from my nostrils, blowing her hair away from her face. Then silence. The entire plane was silent. Only the background noise of the engines and my heavy breathing could be heard. All focus was deservedly on me. She broke first and let out a banshee's wail. Her heart and soul's loss were carried on that eulogy of burning pain. I drew the screaming woman towards my growling jaws and delicately and with emphasis for all to see and feel I bit deep into her throat enjoying the blast of blood from her torn carotid arteries as it poured into my mouth and ran down my chest. Her head slumped back on the remains of her neck and she fell limp and dead. I lifted the body high and let my rage free by letting slip a roar that reverberated down the length of the plane, the body now useless in my hand. So, for maximum effect, I ripped her apart, showering the closest people with blood and guts. For a moment, all became quiet and still, but not for too long. I wanted to murder more. The people were in utter disbelief at this moment. This couldn't be real. I sniffed the remains of the body and, and the broken rib cage and broke it further like a fortune cookie. Then using my index finger, well, index claw of my right hand, I pierced and plucked the still beating heart from the woman's body. I gently placed it in my mouth and sucked on it as though it was some sweet candy. The people just watched this display. No movement, no fear yet, no noise and no hope. They were trapped in a flying cigar tube in the sky with a fucking monster. When the screams came, they came in unison. The waft of their intense fear washed over me. It made the hairs of my pelt rise in delight of their loss. They were now panicking and trying to tear themselves out of their seats, desperately trying to scramble away from the maddened creature that had somehow just appeared before them. They were pushing and barging one another out of the way in their haste. Some fell to the ground to be stood on. These were crushed and smeared into the floor by the feet of those hell-bent on escaping. I came back into the moment, killing my other travel companion in the chair next to me, the now trapped fat businessman who had been annoying with his flatulence on the journey. A wolf's nose is very sensitive, stared up at me, his mouth opening and oh... I stamped him into his seat, into a bloody pulp. The razor-tipped claws of my feet tore him and the upholstery into one bloody pile. His two ugly kids and his plump wife at home would never have the pleasure of the fat, sweaty farter back in their lives. 
You would have been convinced that the plane was shaking with turbulence, but it wasn't. It wasn't the turbulence. It was my anger that rocked us in our flight. A warm Macallan. The emergency oxygen mask fell limply and pointlessly in front of the seats, not something that was going to help these poor people right now, while I spent a couple of moments tearing my way from between the seats. Once free, I continued my way to the front of the plane, ripping and mauling all that stood in my way. The crowd were now falling over each other as they tried to run away. I had no resistance from these poor foes as I grabbed the body here and there, eviscerating and dissecting them in a vicious and violent balletic like performance. Moving to the front of the plane meant that I had to remove seats to let me pass. Some of the seats I tore out still had the passengers in them. These were easy kills, tearing them bodily from the uncomfy chairs and crushing the mangled remains before tossing them behind me as I moved on. Some tried to hide from me in their fear. Some sat there unmoving, frozen in terror at my forward movement. Some tried to run, but had nowhere to go. This was not like shooting fish in a barrel, it was like mauling humans in a flying metal tube. It was easy, and soon none stood any more. The floor of the plane was a pool of cooling blood. Chunks of flesh were pushed to and fore as the blood lapped back and forth like some horrific red tide. Most were dead, some were dying, none would survive this journey. I'd made my way to the cockpit, tearing off the terrorist, not werewolf-proof door, and dragged my massive frame inside the cramped space. The cockpit was dark. Two men sat staring at me, blinking stupidly. They'd been watching the whole massacre on the little CCTV displays of the cabin as the autopilot did the actual flying for them. I grabbed both of the pilots. I think they're both pilots. One with each hand as they panicked and simply crushed them in my grasp, tearing each of them apart with my jaws. I then began to smash into the controls of the plane. I knew I would have to turn off the autopilot to make this fucking thing crash. But in this form, it was just about ripping the cockpit apart until all the warning lights and buzzers stopped and the aircraft started to plummet from the sky. I had created a work of art, one of my greatest... One of my greatest of proportions as well. Over 400 broken and dead in one moment of creation or destruction or both. Maybe I would die too. Here was the test of my immortality. The nose of the plane fell forward and the plane's windscreen became the floor. Blood poured into the cockpit from the passenger compartment of the aircraft. It carried bits and pieces of people in with it. I broke into wolfy laughter at the chaos created at this moment. The world became a spinning, whirling world of fury as we fell. I felt sheer joy in the moment. I smiled at the thoughts that had just passed through my head and took a sip from my chilled Macallan. I thanked the hostess with a smile that she would remember for the rest of her life. They, the people that ruled me, could never control my dreams. I could do anything in my head and destroying normality is always the dream that fills it. I would have to wait. I will make that dream a reality at some point. I must have been mellowing in my old age. I'd not lost control for a long time in public. In fact, the last few missions had been somewhat casualty-free. No no collateral damage, as they say. I must have been slipping, or maybe it... I don't know, it was a plan. Who would know but me? I'd flown from Edinburgh to JFK, New York. At the gate, I'd met the usual two dicks, two CIA-suited bumholes. Looked more like CIA agents than, you can imagine, aviator sunglasses and cheap suits. Again, they were uncommunicative, using very few words. They shepherded me between gates, fingers and ears, looking all American agency. I stopped to eat and made them wait uncomfortably in my non-compliance. I enjoyed their discomfort. They were dicks after all. The next gate had no plane waiting but a car at the bottom of the steps that took me out to a large transport helicopter. Um, any idea where we're going, dickheads? I asked my handlers. No, sir, we have no idea, they replied in a coordinated reply. At least they were fucking polite, you know. I think the helicopter took me somewhere north of the Great Lakes in America. GPS is a wonderful thing, and for some reason they let me keep my phone on this journey. We'd been travelling for a few hours, and a lot of it had been over woodland. 
The two dicks had left me to be babysat by a team of eight heavily armed American Marines. I'd been ordered to sit at the back of the compartment, so obviously, having been ordered, I moved to the front and stood in front of the commanding officer, standing solidly, staring into his eyes until he moved for me from his own seat. I thought so. I smiled as he took a seat at the back of the helicopter. The soldiers themselves, though, showed him no lack of respect for this action. They just accepted it. I wondered what they'd been told about me. Maybe they had been told not to upset me. It was often the way, and, and then we were off. When we got to wherever we were going, the soldiers motioned me towards the door. As soon as the door opened, I grabbed my bag and stepped off the chopper. I literally stepped out of the hold and into the night air while laughing. I landed my now usual deep lunge superhero landing on hitting the ground, very Celeste-like, you know, from Underworld the movie. I looked up at the open doorway above and at three faces that I waved my thanks to before standing. I'd fallen into a small clearing and looked around the wooded site. I took in the sounds and smells of the forest and recognised one scent, one scent above all. He was here. The chief himself stood on the edge of the clearing in plain view. He nodded at me and motioned me to follow after him. He was dressed very strangely in a in a way I'd never seen before. It, it was most unarmy like he wore outdoorsman clothing including colours and everything, not his usual army fatigues. I caught up to him and, and walked alongside him in silence. He turned and smiled at me. He was always a man of few words and I appreciated that. And this was about as good a greeting as that he as he ever gave. We continued to walk to the campsite by the lake where a couple of tents around a central fire pit were. There was a lot of gear outside the tents including fishing rods and rifle bags. This was unlike any job that I'd ever been on before. It almost felt as though it was meant to be something else. I would wait patiently to see what the evening brought. I was feeling a little uncomfortable due to my lack of knowledge of what the fuck was happening. The chief sat down in the camp chair and, and reached towards the fire warm in his hands and then, without words, asked me to take a seat by him. It must have been cold, but I, as usual, had not really noticed. I sat and stared into the flames while I tried to work out what the fuck the angle was that they were trying to work on me. Was this a setup? Would you like a beer, Will? he asked. Of course, I replied and nodded. He reached down beside his seat and into a plastic cooler and brought out a bottle of Budweiser from which he removed the cap and then passed it to me without a word. He then got himself a drink, which he opened and sat back, taking a large swig. Then wiping his mouth, he gave a huge sigh. The evening was truly beautiful. The sky a dark blanket with a dusting of stars. We must have been away from any large conurbations with light that ruined stargazing. We sat in silence for a long time, just drinking and admiring the view. The sounds of nature were in full abound. The crickets chirped in the background and I could sense the life around us. I felt the rodents beneath the ground. I sensed the herd of deer that was settling down for the night at some distance. The owl in the tree above us was on the hunt. A bear in the distance, full and content. We were surrounded by life yet on our own utterly. I sensed no other human being within miles of us. No smells. No unnatural noise. We were truly alone. At this realisation, I smiled internally. Someone had fucked up. And at this point, I knew that it had not been me. I had been patient and waited for this opportunity. I knew it would eventually happen, so I grabbed it. The chief spoke. Well, Will, I thought it was time we should spend some time together as friends. We are friends now, aren't we? I nodded and smiled as I raised my bottle to him and toasted him. Again, inside, I was smiling and Fen was smiling back at me. You've done a lot of amazing work for us and we're getting a lot of respect from the important people that do and think important things. He took a pack of cigars from his pocket, offering me one before choosing one and reaching for a branch from the fire and lighting it for himself. It was dark by the powers that be. It was time that we got to know one another properly and see where we're going to go in the future. He paused and puffed life into his cigar. They believe that you are, in fact, enjoying your job. 
They think that you're actually feeling some loyalty towards us and our ideals. He was enjoying pontificating with his cigar, emphasising parts of his language. I smiled and laughed a little jovially. He really had no idea how my head worked. It thrilled me to realise that he was so fucking far away from the truth. What a fucking idiot. The posit rolled around behind him on the floor, laughing madly in my head. I sat, just staring at him for a while. Disbelief. Well, chief, I've been thinking of something very different myself. I think that I'm on a point of retirement. I replied, taking a swig from the bottle and leaning forward, resting my elbows on my knees and looking directly at him. The chief hesitated and sat back in his seat. He removed his cap and scratched his head. Obviously, he was irritated. Ah, I think that I've made a grave mistake then. He paused and turned to look at me. I assumed that we'd become friends and that we could work together in the future. Hmm. I'm sorry, boss, I said, leaning back comfortably into my seat and finishing the rest of my beer. I, d I don't want to do these things anymore. I mean, it's been fun, but I just don't like being told what to do by anyone. So I was just waiting for an opportunity to be able to quit, I sighed. And do you know what? This has become an excellent opportunity for me to quit in person to you. I can't sense anyone within miles. Normally, you would have a cover of at least a squad or two, but I can't smell or sense anyone. I paused and, for dramatic effect, sniffed the darkening evening air. No one's here for you. I left a long pause and gave a beatific smile. I am afraid the only person here is me. Again, I looked directly at him and pointed to my chest, a big smile across my face. I should therefore imagine that it would take a while for a rescue party to get to us, and I should imagine that they are probably on their way now. I looked to the skies in the pretense of searching for black helicopters. Yes, Will? You're quite correct. They are a, a few miles away listening to this conversation. Obviously, I miscalculated our relationship, he said, taking off his hat and scratching his head as he smiled up at me. I'm afraid so. We are supposed to have built a rapport between us. I mean, you and me. We're supposed to be friends by now. and I get that, and through that, I would have been much easier to manipulate for whatever ends that they needed. I think that they have underestimated my level of psychotic rage, I'm afraid. Still, because you've been a, a mostly good master, I will make it quick and then what I'm going to do is fuck off into the forest and disappear. But, can I say, thank you for this opportunity, boss. I gave him a courteous nod. Oh, is there any way I can change your mind, Will? He paused, looking up at me from his seat. More money? Less work? Pick and choose the things you do, he questioned. No, boss. I really want my freedom. I want to live for me again, I replied. I stood up in front of him and smiled as he took a long drag on his smoke. One moment, Will. Let me enjoy this last guilty pleasure. I nodded and waited as he drank his last beer and smoked his last cigar. Okay, he said, as he crushed the butt beneath his foot and tossed the empty bottle behind him where it broke on the rocks. I'm ready. Well, Chief, first of all, I kind of have to admit that I knew about this operation that was going to go on today. I believe it was called, named Operation Getting to Know You. I sang the King and I musical line, then laughed. In turn, I have planned for today as well. Posit and I, I nodded at Posit, he nodded back, did some spying of our very own behind your back. We found out where you and your lovely wife, Martha, live. Ah, Martha, 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 Martha. What? he asked as his face became concerned. Y you did what? Oh, no. The chief looked down at his feet, shaking his head and bringing his hands up to cover his face and leaning forward. Oh, 
God. Oh, God. Yes, Michael. Oh, God, I said. I paused as I let the enormity of this situation sink in. I didn't want to rush him into his realisation. I wanted to savour its deep flavour. Yes, it was a long and difficult journey to Bilthwells. Did most of it in the back of a truck so I could keep it all a little secret from you guys. Your people have been a bit lax recently with security and care since you trusted me. I added the air quotes with my fingers as I said the word trusted. You know, now that we're friends, you even believed me that my tracking devices fell out. More air quotes. You have a beautiful home, Michael. Or is it Mike? I prefer Michael. I think it suits you. I I had you down as a Billy for some reason. I said, turning away and taking a deep breath of the cool night air. Your home, Michael, is very nice. The money you earn keeps you in good stead with a nice bit of land and woodland. I bet there are a few trout in that lake nearby. Again, I paused. I really thought you were American, you know. Had not the foggiest that you were a Welshie with that accent. Taff, isn't it? Anyways, to get back to my salient point, the house and grounds were not even being watched. <laughs> I used all the training that you gave me to check it all out, and the posit did a sweep of the house and just found one woman at home. She was upstairs in the green bedroom at the back of the cottage. It was, oh God, it has a nice Victorian brass bedstead and a lovely wood burning stove. Oh, and an ensuite bathroom, which is always a, a lovely touch. All white Italian porcelain. Very nice. She was sound asleep. He now looked up at me for a, a moment. The distress was evident on his face. No hate at this point. No wanton revenge. Just distress and disbelief. Oh, God, Will, you didn't. He stuttered. You didn't. Please tell me. M my Martha will. He held his face in his hands again and sat staring into the fire. Tears were forming in his eyes. Now, at this point, I have to say sorry about Summer and Cloud. Nice dogs. They were a bit noisy though, so you know the drill. I had to kill them. That's one of the first things we do in espionage and all that. I saved the collars though. Here they are. I reached into my duffel bag and pulled out the two leather collars and threw them to his feet. Nice bit of leather work there, I laughed. God's sake. God's sake. <laughs> he stammered, wiping his eyes with the back of his hands. God's sake, Will. I smiled and shook my head as I walked over to him and reached beside him for a beer from the cool box. He flinched away for a moment, which made me smile. Yes, Martha... She was beautiful. I held the bottle in front of me as though interested in the label stuck there. I returned my focus back to the chief and then continued. Really, honestly, I can see why you loved her. I mean, she was strong and fierce and so proud of you. I respected her so much. She got very upset when I said I'd killed the dogs. I even offered to share them with her. A little ungrateful. You know, she was really. The Koreans get that tenderly beaten dog is a delicacy. I stopped to see if she would give me any reaction, but there was nothing. Her ending was so brutal, she begged and begged and begged, but I bravely managed to live up to my hype and tortured her thoroughly and systematically, just as you taught me. I paused once more, giving him time to unpackage his thoughts. Then I killed her. Her liver was divine, I cliched. Only a light drinker, I think. I stopped to tear the top off the bottle and, and took what seemed like a well-earned swig. Ah, lovely. Oh, she also told me about these. I reached again into my duffel bag and took out some photographs. I looked at them and then at him. Nice family. And you can see how much you cared. There were pictures everywhere. Vanessa is doing so well in IT. I showed him a group picture photo and pointed out Vanessa to him. And Nick is a doctor of all things, a proctologist, which is always a strange choice for me. But, get it, but, I suppose someone has to do it, has to get their fingers dirty as it were, I said, looking at my fingers and wiggling them a little. He should have spotted the prostate cancer that you have. Tough one, eh? You know about that, don't you? The prostate cancer you have. I can see it from here as plain as day. I kept meaning to tell you, but then I didn't. Hey, but I am an evil bastard, huh? 
I shrugged it off. You are dying, and your son could have helped you. Laughable, really. This is little Noah, Vanessa's son, and Autumn, her daughter. You must have been, sorry, past tense. They're such proud grandparents. How old were they? He didn't respond. Oh, come on, Michael, how old? He ran his fingers through the stubble on his chin. It was an audible rasp in the quiet night air. You're a bastard. Will, if you've touched them, if you've touched them, he started to massage his temples with his eyes closed. His words got quieter and less emphasised as he realised his truly powerless state. His head turned and started looking at me again as though trying to decipher my thoughts. Amazingly... He still had no hate in his eyes, just grief. He sat shaking his head. I pointed at him, a warning finger to emphasise my next question. You're going to do what, Michael? You're going to do nothing. You've been playing with me like a toy for years now. You've been using me as a tool. You and yours have been treating me like a fucking dog. I'm a wolf, Michael. A fucking wolf. I have no master. I drew my hand back to my chin and spawned a pose. You were dead the day we met. It was just that, at that point, you hadn't realised it. And and you're going to suffer for all those vulnerable moments I had to endure. You, my friend, could not control this. I swept my hand down my front as though I was a piece of evidence. Your bosses should have destroyed me the day they caught me. Their overconfidence and lack of care have caused this. I have no friends or allegiances. It is just me and my posit. You absolute... Uh, I couldn't think of a decent enough word for the following statement. Dumbass. Not good enough word for this occasion. You, as my friend... As though I would bow to you to fetch for you like a common mutt. I turned away from him, walking a small distance. Roll over, Will. That's a good boy. Sit by. Stay. Here's a biscuit. Bambi, bambi, bambi. Bambi, bambi, bambi. Bambi, bambi, bambi. Turning to face him once more and with spit flying from my mouth, I shouted at him. No! I don't think he was listening at this point. Will, 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 he repeated, head in his hands, rocking back and forth in his seat. Anyway, I promise you this, your family is dead. I will wipe all that you hold dear from the earth. I know where they live and what they do. And with all the fantastic training that you gave me, I will get to them and I'm going to kill them. The only good thing from your point of view is that you will not be around to know this. He was sobbing. I could sense him breaking, crying. At last, this man showed some fucking emotion. At last, the confidence was gone and he was falling apart in front of me. I smiled at my posit and he spoke to me in my mind. This is so beautiful, Will. Will, beautiful. Physical torture does not touch this. It's been a long time in coming, but it's so good to see. He was delighted. Martha died proudly. My friend, again I grinned. Then checking my nails, I added, She died painfully, but proudly. Well, she was acting proudly for a bit. I looked at him again. She did beg to live, then beg to die after I'd started my work. I have it here on record if you wish to watch it with me. I offered him my phone. He ignored me. No, I guess not, I said. I pressed play on the phone and the screaming and the crying began in the background. I switched it off and put the phone back in my pocket. I've got to admit it wasn't my best work. I sniffed. He slowly got up out of his seat and walked away from me to the other side of the fire. He paused and put his head in his hands once more. I watched closely, trying to gauge the man's next actions. It turned out that he just stood there and started to shake and shudder as the emotions of loss and grief overtook his frame. Eventually he turned to me, tears in his eyes, looking at me in disbelief. Why? He really couldn't understand what was happening. It's in my nature, Chief. 
let me quote a few things you labelled me with quite early on. Do you remember the meeting with all those big wigs back in the day? One of the gifts of being a werewolf is I have a didactic memory. So the stuff you said to those important people in that room is still there. I can quote it for you. I then gave him a list verbatim. One. An all-around evil son of a bitch. I smiled. That's only true if you define my acts as evil. I must admit, though, I like it. Oh, and my mum was not a bitch either. She was just a mortal human woman doing her best. Two. He may look like a kind and gentle fellow, but let me tell you that he is one of the most psychotic and brutal killers I have ever had the pleasure to meet. That's true. I laughed. All those psychotic lends itself to the fact that I have some kind of medical issue or something. My psychotic tendencies to me are a blessing. Just my predatory thing. When I kill, I do care about it. Well, most of the time. Anyways, I do have to eat. Three. He is a cannibal and a child killer and has personally dispatched untold numbers of people into the next world with his own hands or claws or teeth or whatever. That's not really true. I'm not really a cannibal, to be honest. Although the rest of it's pretty correct. I've never eaten a werewolf. 4. He's a consummate liar and a narcissist of the highest order. This is also true, but I have to say, look at me. Of course I am. I love myself. Who wouldn't? Oh, yes, you. You would not love me right now, I mean. I pulled a sad face and then made a big false smile. 5. He is incredibly charismatic and the most dangerous living thing to strike the western world since smallpox. Such fucking flattery, I said waving a hand at him in a very camp manner. Six. He's already remembered your face, your smell and whatever else his senses tell him and will probably in the future want to kill you and yours for your humiliation. I don't think I will have time to get all of them. One or two we'll just have to do. Seven. And listen to this one. I know he wants to kill me. I paused for dramatic effect, taking my hand to my brow and then swept it in his direction. Correctamundo, I proclaimed. And I'm going to, and everyone you know and you love. He fell to his knees, rocking back and forth as he let go of his emotions, taking his head in his hands. He fell forward with his forehead on the ground, the Close cropped grass muffled his despair. I walked over to him, standing over him like the god of wrath that I actually was. Do you know who Fenrir was in Norse mythology? I asked. My posit is called Fenrir, if I have to remind you that is. I paused to wait for his answer, but rudely he just continued to cry. Disgusted, I kicked him onto his side where he took up a pitiful fetal position. I asked... Do you know who Fenrir was? Which god have we become as a beast? What my destiny is? Still no response. Well, we are the killer of Odin, the Allfather. I stood above his prone body, gesticulating to the sky. They tethered me at the bottom of the world tree because they feared my power. They tricked me into being trapped for their pleasure, much like you did, Michael. Teased me, even. Then when I broke free, I ate him. I ate Odin and brought about the end of the world. Ragnarok. I motioned to the heavens, expecting the clash of thunder to punctuate my sentence. It didn't. Annoying that. I slowly dropped my arms and gave my bowing thanks to my imaginary audience of fans. Then I crouched down close to him, a little calmer. Sorry, I whispered in his ear. The amateur dramatics in my soul took over. I patted him softly and laughed. Hey, it was not bad though, was it? I mean, if you take that all into account, I'm likening you to Odin. How cool's that? He turned his face up to me and smiled. Fucking five-star mental will. Fenrir or whatever the fuck you are. I struck only one blow to his head. I promised a quick death. It crushed his skull and he lay still. He was, well, very dead. And I watched over him as as he cooled in the evening air, listening to the, the crackle of the fire. 
I drank the remains of my beer and set the bottle down on the ground very carefully. I did feel a little sorry for the man, which shocked me. He'd been my master and my handler, but part of me had actually liked him. I then heard the noise of the choppers in the distance as they were making their way to us. I changed, absorbing my posit and becoming Fenrir the god while staring at the old man lying there. He trusted me. What a fucking fool. I laughed as a human throughout my transformation and laughed as a wolf. The laugh became guttural, inhuman. With one last look about, I ran into the trees. I would be hunted for a while, but they would regret that choice. They should just let me go. Now I knew of them. I learned how the systems they used work, so I knew how to defeat them. This would be my greatest adventure. I was dealing with the best the world had and hunting the very best of their own hunters. This was going to be fucking fun. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed the series. That's the end of the first series. I will be bringing you more. Please go to the description that goes with the podcast. There is a link to support the show. If you want to give me some money, that would be wonderful. I would really appreciate that. If you don't, fair enough. There's also a link to Amazon to buy my book. It's really cheap. Go and buy it. It's really cheap. Many have got it. Also, I will put a Facebook group link in the descriptor as well so you can become part of my little psychotic community of wonderfully dark broken mentally asphyxiated people I love so deeply bye